Thank you for standing by and welcome to SPX Technologies second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. To remove yourself from the queue, you may press star 11 again. I would now like to hand the call over to Paul Clegg, VP, Investor Relations and Communications. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. With me on the call today are Gene Lowe, our President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Verano, our Chief Financial Officer. Press release containing our second quarter results was issued today after market close. You can find the release in our earnings slide presentation, as well as a link to a live webcast of this call in the Investor Relations section of our website at spx.com. I encourage you to review our disclosure and discussion of gap results in the press release and to follow along with a slide presentation during our prepared remarks. A replay of the webcast will be available on our website until August 8th. As a reminder, portions of our presentation and comments are forward-looking and subject to safe harbor provisions. Please also note the risk factors in our most recent SEC filings. Our comments today will largely focus on adjusted financial results and comparisons will be to the results of continuing operations only. You can find detailed reconciliations of historical adjusted figures from their respective gap measures in the appendix to today's presentation. Our adjusted earnings per share exclude acquisition-related costs, non-service pension items, mark-to-market changes, amortization expense, and other items. Finally, we will be meeting with investors at various events during the third quarter, including the Seaport Virtual Investor Conference on August 21st and the Jefferies Industrial Conference on September 5th in New York. And with that, I will turn the call over to Jean. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. On the call today, we'll provide you with an update on our consolidated and segment results for the second quarter of 2024. We're also once again increasing our guidance for the full year. We have strong results for the quarter. In Q2, our company continued to execute well and drove substantial growth in all of our key profit measures with significant year-on-year increases in margin. We continue to experience robust demand across key markets and gain momentum in our continuous improvement initiatives. Today, we are raising our full year 2024 guidance. Our new midpoint reflects year-on-year growth of 35% in adjusted EBITDA and 28% in adjusted EPS. Turning to our high-level results, for the second quarter, we grew revenue by 18.4% and adjusted EBITDA by 45% year-on-year with 400 basis points of margin expansion. We achieved several firsts in this quarter, including the first quarter since the spin, with a revenue in excess of $500 million, and with adjusted operating income of more than $100 million. We also achieved our highest post-spin EBITDA and EBITDA margin, which reached $109 million and 21.7% respectively. As always, I'd like to update you on our value creation efforts during the quarter. In Q2, we had a number of successes with new products. In our cooling business, we received multiple orders and quotes for our newly introduced Olympus V adiabatic unit, which optimizes the balance between power usage and water usage for a number of different cooling applications. In our detection and measurement segment, our location and inspection platform continued to gain traction converting customers to our new precision locators with instant mapping capabilities. This upgraded product simplifies and speeds up the process of mapping underground utilities. We also gained further acceptance among utility customers on our cross-bore inspection equipment, which facilitates the location of risk areas between gas and water lines. On the operational front, we are executing well on cross-selling opportunities allowing our recent acquisitions to leverage our well-established sales channels to expand their market reach. We are further broadening our exposure to robust growth markets, such as data centers and healthcare. 
We also continue to see momentum in our continuous improvement initiatives, including further gains and throughput in our HVAC facility. And now I'll turn the call over to Mark to review our financial results. Thanks, Gene. Q2 was another very strong quarter for SPX Technologies. Year on year, our adjusted EPS grew 34% to $1.42. In addition to our typical adjustments, adjusted earnings this quarter exclude a charge for the resolution of a legal dispute. The after-tax impact to adjusted EPS was $0.13 cents per share. The settlement resolved all litigation related to an earn-out payment to the former owner of ULC. For the quarter, total company revenue increased 18.4% year-on-year. Organically, revenue grew 9%, driven by HVAC, while acquisitions drove a 9.5% increase, and FX was a slight headwind. Consolidated segment income grew by $33.2 million, or 39.3%, to $117.6 million, while segment margin increased 360 basis points. For the quarter in our HVAC segment, revenues grew 32.5% year-on-year. On an organic basis, revenues increased 17.7%, driven by higher cooling sales, including approximately $20 million from the delivery of a large cooling service project that has no equivalent in the remaining quarters of 2024 or in the prior year period. Acquisitions contributed growth of 15% and included Ingenia in our cooling platform and Aspect in our heating platform. The FX impact was nominal. Segment income grew by $28.5 million, or 51.6%, while segment margin increased 300 basis points. The increases in segment income and margin were due to acquisitions and operating leverage from higher organic cooling sales, including the benefit of continuous improvement initiatives. Segment backlog at quarter end was $434 million, roughly flat organically from the prior year period. For the quarter in detection and measurement, revenues decreased 6.2% year-on-year. FX was negligible. The decrease in revenue was driven largely by lower Comtex sales associated with a large pass-through project delivered during 2023 and into Q1 of this year. Year-on-year segment income grew $4.7 million and margin increased 450 basis points. We had favorable sales mix in Q2 driven by lower than typical margins on the pass-through project delivered in the prior year, as well as a shift in project delivery schedules, which brought forward some higher margin projects into the quarter. Segment income and margin also benefited from efforts to enhance the efficiency of our segment structure, which we expect to continue in the second half. Segment backlog at quarter end is $205 million, down 12% organically from the prior year due to deliveries of the pass-through project. Absent this project, backlog was up mid-single digits. Turning now to our financial position at the end of the quarter. We ended Q2 with cash of $133 million and total debt of $790 million. Our leverage ratio as calculated under our bank credit agreement was 1.6 times. We anticipate our leverage ratio declining below the lower end of our target range of one and a half to two and a half times by year end, assuming no additional capital deployment. Adjusted free cash flow for the quarter was approximately $58 million. Moving on to our guidance. We are increasing our guidance for adjusted EPS to a range of $5.45 to $5.60 compared with a prior range of $5.15 $5.40. The new midpoint reflects year-on-year -year growth of approximately 28%. This guidance update reflects our strong 2Q performance and second-half outlook, particularly on margins. In HVAC, we are increasing revenue guidance by $5 million to reflect stronger cooling volumes and raising margin guidance by 75 basis points to reflect more efficient production and more favorable sales mix. In detection and measurement, we are raising our outlook for segment income and increasing margin guidance by 75 basis points as we continue our initiative to drive segment margin to historical levels. At a total company level, we anticipate adjusted EBITDA in a range of $410 million to $430 million. 
At the midpoint, this reflects year-on-year -year growth, 35%, and a margin of approximately 21%. With respect to second half gating, in HVAC, as is typical, we expect Q4 to be our highest revenue and margin quarter. While Q3 revenue is anticipated to be modestly down sequentially due to a large cooling service project we called out in Q2. In DNM, we expect higher margin project revenue to be more weighted to Q3 than Q4. As always, you will find modeling considerations in the appendix to our presentation. I'll now turn the call back over to Gene for a review of our end markets and his closing comments. Thanks, Mark. Current market conditions support our updated 2024 outlook. Within HVAC, we continue to see strong demand for our cooling products across a broad set of end market applications, including data centers, healthcare facilities, semiconductor plants, and industrial facilities. In heating, overall demand remains stable, and we're seeing initial traction on climate conscious solution introductions. In detection and measure, we continue to experience flattish global demand in our short cycle business with regional variation, while project orders remain healthy. In summary, I'm very pleased with our Q2 performance. With robust demand and significant operational momentum, we're well positioned to achieve our updated full year guidance, which implies 35% growth in adjusted EBITDA. We see multiple opportunities to continue growing our businesses, both organically and through our attractive acquisition pipeline. Looking ahead, I remain very excited about our future. With the right strategy and a highly capable, experienced team, I see significant opportunity to continue driving value for years to come. With that, I'll turn the call back to Paul. Thanks, Gene. Operator, we will now go to questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 one, one on your telephone. To remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star 1-1 one, one again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Ross Sparenbleck of William Blair. Hey, guys. Hey, Ross. Hey. Hey, congrats on the quarter. You know, another solid beat and raise here. Uh, maybe just, you know, considering the Dodge Index, I know you went through some of the end markets within cooling. Uh, sounds like Simmons are still strong, but how should we think about commentary coming out of the, you know, this quarter this far around weak, weaker utility spend? And also it sounds like maybe EVs are sliding to the right. I know that's been a decent mix within HVAC cooling tower uh, yeah, previously. Is there any change of sentiment there? Yeah, Ross, I think if you look at it, we're actually feeling very good about what we're seeing in our end market strength. As you know, we're very diverse. We serve a lot of different end markets, but the number of larger markets that are very strong just provide a lot of tailwinds for us. Specifically, data center remains very strong, um, and we're seeing some nice wins, some nice new customers, and some, some very nice trends there. Healthcare pharma has been very strong. We see continued tailwinds there. Institutional is now a very significant portion of our business. You're talking about government, schools, things like that. We've seen a nice traction there. And then the last two would be industrial and industrial tech. Uh, industrial tech would be, as you'd refer to, things like uh, chip plants, battery plants, EVs. And, you know, there will be inconsistent timing on those, but there's still some large orders out there. I think if you look at it across HVAC, we still feel very good about the uh, demand environment that we see in front of us, uh, both for this year, but then also uh, looking ahead uh, to next year as well. All right, that's very helpful. Uh, on detection and measurement, this is probably the first time I've heard you guys speak to continuous improvement, just knowing that it is more of a you know, disparate platforms. Can you help us get a sense of what that impact was relative to mix and maybe just cross margin expectations? I know you gave some color on the second half, but yeah, any, any color there would be great. Yeah, you know, I'll start out. I think there's been a lot of focus on margins and detection and measurement. I'd say John Swan and his team have really done a nice job. I think that the segment strategy is working. We are seeing some some leverage in in, in how we develop software, how we 
uh, how we do things in a smarter way that is it really makes us more productive. And that's you're really seeing that starting to flow through in the numbers. So um, I would say that if you look at it, in virtually all of our our platforms within detection and measurement, we're seeing very nice progress. It's very good. Um, you know, as you know, there's not as much manufacturing in detection and measurements. There's more software and light assembly. Uh, the, the most of the lean initiatives tend to be, uh, I would say, outside of the facility, more focused on things like value engineering, um, pushing more throughput through our bidding processes, uh, optimizing our front end, our engineering and NPI processes. So it's just a little bit different than because there's less engineering there, but we are seeing some really nice improvement in our supply chain and in our optimization. Um, you had a little more, Mark, and from, from your point of view, I know you spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, Ross, I think, you know, we just, as Gene uh, enunciated there, I mean, we just had really good traction with respect to, to those efforts. I mean, it's been a key initiative for us as we think about driving margin levels back to on a 22 to 24% level. So uh, a lot of good work on that on that front. And it's really when you look at the guidance, which I, you haven't asked that question, but I, I'm sure someone will go there. You think about the, the implied margin uh, in our guide for uh, the back half of the year. A lot of that uh, benefit and, and the reason for that is driven by these initiatives and the expectation that we can drive more value uh, at the margin line the business, it's businesses in DNM. Got it. So there's nothing really to call out that would imply that incrementals should divert from the healthy levels we saw in the second quarter here. Well, there, there's a little bit. This, sorry, Ross. This is Paul. Maybe there's a, there are a few moving parts this quarter that uh, may make sense to just take a step back and unpack some of that. The, a lot of the benefit that you saw in the 2Q margin in DNM was really timing within the year. And so what we're talking about there, we had some projects push into the quarter with higher margin, and then others move out of the quarter that had, let's call it, average margin. And we also had some delayed spending that we do think will catch up on in the second half of the year. All that a couple million uh, dollars there. Um, right. But we, as I said, we've made really good progress here on the initiatives. And if you look at the update in our guidance for the full year, you get an implied increase in segment income of about Three to three to four million dollars, three and a half, let's call it, and uh, that, that's really the the margin initiatives, and that's spread through Q2 and the second half. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Blair of Oppenheimer. Thank you. Good afternoon, guests. Hey, Brent. Hey. Another fantastic quarter for HVAC, specifically in your, uh, your cooling platform. So level set, um, if you're willing to share the detail on uh, profit improvement year in year, how much of the 300 basis point expansion would be attributable to volume, price cost, uh, productivity, uh, and mix creative deal contribution? Yeah, Brian, this is Paul. We had... Uh Kind of three notable drivers of the year-over-year -year increase of about 300 basis points. Uh, the first was really operating leverage on the organic increase. Of, uh, organically, we were up, you know, 17, 18, about 18 percent, and so that was almost half of the 300 basis points. The acquisitions were the next largest driver, maybe about a third, and then the rest of it was really outperformance on that service project that we mentioned. Um, in terms of price uh, cost, it is uh, a benefit. It's not it, these the benefits we're seeing are not as large as we, as we saw a year or so ago, um, but uh, it, it was uh, a favorable tailwind that we get caught up in that in the operating leverage there. Okay, understood. Appreciate the detail. And uh, perhaps offer a little a little more color on how run rate DNM orders trended through the quarter and into early Q3. Um, particularly interested in uh, radio trends, given the somewhat canary nature of that business. Yeah, I think, you know, overall, Brian, what I'd say is uh, DNM is steady. You know, it's been flattish. 
on the run rate businesses and then on the project businesses, I would say it, it's very healthy. Um, we, we expect to finish the year with a very strong backlog for DNM, significantly higher, which we think is going to set us up well, 25 and 26. But, but you're right, radio um, and our L9 platforms, you know, radio is typically a canary in a coal mine, but radio is holding, holding steady. And actually, we're seeing a few things that are kind of positive there. So um, we feel good about where radio is. And um, as a matter of fact, I was just talking to the GM this morning. Um, we're seeing some, some uh, loosening and some, some positive signs on uh, continental Europe, which is pretty small for us, but we're seeing some, some positive inclinations there. The second thing would be um, the UK, I believe, just cut uh, slightly, I believe a quarter of a point, and you're seeing more activity there. UK is a, is a meaningful market for radio detection. So I'd say flattish with you know, potentially some, some positive early signals there. Okay, that's encouraging. I uh, will get back in queue. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Damien Karras of UBS. Hey, good evening, everyone. Congrats on the quarter. Hey, Damien. Hey, yeah, thanks. I wanted to ask you a follow-up on your margins just because the performance has been impressive you know you're raising the guidance a uh, few straight quarters and that's after you know 300 basis points or so of expansion last year so i was wondering if maybe you could just kind of you know hone in a little bit on on the execution and and where it's been better than expected you know any of those initiatives that are you know really driving kind of the outside margin uh performance and, and how much you, how much juice do you think you got left in the tank, Gene? <laughs> hey, Damien, I'll, I'll start. I mean, we, we've talked about this over the last few quarters. As you know, we've been we've been investing, a, you know, a tremendous amount of capital relative to where we've been historically. Uh, you know, this year I think we targeted you know 40 million plus, and and you know that's close to two percent of revenue. So you know, a good kind of half percent above where we've been. And those have been just very strategic investments across the cooling platform uh, in areas where we can, you know, drive both incremental throughput, drive efficiencies, uh, as well as reduce labor content. So we're kind of seeing it really across the footprint. Uh, that has been ongoing really for 12 plus months. Uh, we're not through with it. Uh, there is more uh, activities and uh, upgrades, if you like, to those facilities that will kind of continue throughout the year. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, in a, in a broad stroke, what's really driving it. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't suggest that there's one particular change that we made. It's really the combination of all of that. And then you overlay kind of a CI mentality to it as we're thinking about uh, the activities within these plants. Yeah, and, that, you know, one, one small thing I would add is, you know, as a reminder, um, detection and measurement, really our target's always been 22 to 24. We believe that, that that business should operate there, and it's nice to see you get back there and really good work there. The, 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 the segment that's really changed has been HVAC, which, you know, remember the jumping off point of the number you're talking about was probably a little bit suppressed due to some of the COVID supply chain, some of the labor challenges, and a lot of the good work that we were doing was was hidden at that time, or it was it was impacted by those other areas. But I think that's where you know you think we had hit, historically had around a 16% business, and that has structurally changed. As Mark has alluded to, a lot of the investments in productivity, a lot of the growth in demand and the operational leverage, but also don't forget about uh, M&A. M&A has has added, we think, in the neighborhood over the past two years. Uh, you know, you're talking in the neighborhood of 150, 200 basis points to that line. And so, um, structurally, we do believe HVAC's a much stronger business unit. Sean and the team have, have done a phenomenal job over the past couple of years, and we feel good about the, the future there. That's great. And that's actually a good segue, Gene. I wanted to 
ask you about the acquisitions, uh, you know, kind of <clears throat> three notable ones uh, over the past year combined, you know, that's a pretty sizable chunk of your HVAC segment now. So how have these, you know, acquisitions been performing relative to your initial expectations? You know, I guess kind of early thoughts on Ingenia, but, um, you know, Aspect and Tamco, you're kind of about a year in. So uh, appreciate any color on that. Yeah, I would just, uh, we are very pleased with these three acquisitions. So there's, Ingenia, which we think all three of these businesses are very good businesses, have great value propositions, great competitive positions. Um, and then two of them are also very linked to data centers. And we have seen just some very nice growth. So I think, you know, Ingenia, Aspect, and Tamco, as a reminder, Ingenia's air handling, um, that is very linked to healthcare, pharma. You know, we're in a situation there where we have so much demand for our product, our focus is on making sure we can expand our capacity fast enough. Uh, we are truly capacity constrained there, and a lot of our time and our effort is, is building and enhancing that because we do believe we have a better solution in the market. We really have a very good product. Uh, Aspect and Tamco also are, are, are performing at a a very a very solid level. I think if you look at these three put together, I would say revenue is in the neighborhood of our plans, but we are exceeding uh, in in our profit levels. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is not only is there good performance of these uh, individually, but we actually think there's some really nice synergies that we're seeing and we're starting to capture. For example, Ingenia, when you get into the specification of a air handling unit, they can oftentimes influence the downstream spe specification. For example, uh, they can influence uh, Tamco, you know, as uh, you know, in, uh, as a basis of design. They can also influence um, our air uh, products, our Strobic product line, which oftentimes will actually get built into the air handling unit. Uh, we also get uh, leads for our other product categories because we'll know a hospital is going up here or a pharmaceutical is going up there. And some of our businesses like Marley Cooling, we have very good coverage. So there's not a lot that we don't see, but being able to get in early and meet the engineers' influence uh, is meaningful. So I'd say that we see some real synergies across uh, the businesses there. They are very synergistic, and I'd say we're still in the early days of um, capturing that. But we, yeah, we, I would say we're very pleased with with all three of these. And uh, you know, interestingly, we had our biggest year last year where we deployed north of eight hundred million dollars of capital. So very big for a company our size. And we're going to be we'll be materially below our. 1.5 times by year end. And so it, I think it's a testament to, you know, our model where we just generate a lot of cash and it allows us to invest that cash in growth. And I think last year to this year is, is a good example of that, as well as I think the prior four years, we, we kind of had it rolling. But, um, yeah, we're so good about, you know, stepping back a little bit. One of the, one of the common questions is what are you seeing on the M&A front? And I'd say our... Uh, activity pipelines healthy. Uh, we actually see some very interesting opportunities for growth on our detection and measurement side. The last three were all on our HVAC side. But um, it's, a, it's a good, healthy market, and we, we believe in our strategy, and we're going to continue executing on it. Great color. Thanks. I'll pass it along. Thanks, Damian. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steve Farazani of Sedoti. Good evening, everyone. I uh, appreciate all the detail tonight. Uh, I, I want to follow up your, your last comments, Gene. Uh, you pointed out that, that, that net leverage probably, I mean, you're well on your way to getting back below the target range. Looks like there's a little bit of debt reduction in the quarter. How are you thinking until the next deal comes along on uh, uses of cash? Working capital was up a little bit. There was a little bit of a build, but you still generated a, a significant amount of cash flow this quarter. 
Yeah, Steve, I mean, you know, our, our priorities, right, for use of capital are, are obviously growth, right, whether that's uh, yeah. organic or inorganic. And, you know, I think when, when I think about the pipeline of opportunities out there and what we're seeing in the M&A space, you know, we feel good uh, about, uh, you know, where we are and the opportunity to deploy capital going forward uh, in that. So, you know, our, our, our cash flow has been and continues to be more back-end loaded uh, than it is in the first half of the year. Uh, so you're, to Gene's point, you will see that, you know, deleveraging coming in as we roll into the third and fourth quarter of the year. Um, you know, but we, we do have a, you know, fairly substantial CapEx plan this year that I referenced earlier, and uh, we're about halfway through that. Uh, when you think about what we signal to the street uh, as our overall spend year to date, or through the first six months, we're at about 20 million. So, you know, you'll see capital continue to be deployed to that. And then, you know, to the extent, uh, you know, there aren't uh, any kind of other opportunities, we'll just continue to, to pay down debt in the near term. Yeah, and I would say, you know, if you look at historically, you know, our focus has been growth. We believe it's part of our flywheel and our model. And really all of our investments have been in growth. I would say it's unlikely uh, to, to look at a dividend over the next couple of years. And as, and as you know, we did do a, a smallish buy, uh, buyback well, a couple of years ago, maybe yeah. three or four years ago. But I would say the 95% plus of our capital over the past you know, time frame has been really, really been deployed on growth. I wouldn't anticipate that to change over the next couple of years, Steve. Yeah, I think our views are consistent are with what we've kind of shared at the investor day on that front. Right. Absolutely. Uh, how are you thinking about CapEx? I think, Gene, you mentioned earlier in, in response to one of your questions, some, some capacity constraints on one of the acquisitions. Do you need to add capacity for some of these faster growth HVAC acquisitions, and, and, and should we expect that? Yeah, I think we will need to add capacity, but I wouldn't anticipate this to be anything that's really – noticeable. I think for us, you know, we think of our CapEx as normally at around one and a half times. Um, we did a lot of capital investments in our primary cooling business, a significant amount of lasers and punches, which drove a really significant amount of revenue, uh, which, which really has allowed us to grow. Um, you know, I, I would... I, I would expect to see that continue in, in, in certain areas and start to get um, capacity constrained. But I, I think in large measure, you know, we could have elevated CapEx in the 2% range, um, you know, if we uh, maintain, you know, we've had a lot of growth. If you look at the HVAC for the past two years, the organic growth alone was the plan of this year and last year is 23% organic growth. That's a significant amount of growth. Yeah. Um, but yep. but I don't see any large out of the ordinary. And and, and Mark, uh, any any color you'd like to add there? And as we look ahead for 25 and six, anything else? Any other color you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean I think you you kind of largely covered it, Gene. I mean we'll just you know we're going to continue to you know, deploy capital where we can generate the highest return. Um, and uh, there will be some opportunities, I think, on the organic front to continue to invest. Um, so you could see it slightly elevated relative to where we've been historically. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's a growth focus, and um, you know, my expectation is, you know, M&A will be at the forefront and will continue to be. I will say the capital we have deployed, I believe, has had a tremendous return. And, you know, not only was it the capital, but it was the lean projects that we had. And I think that has been, as you had pointed out, not only uh, the ability to drive more throughput, but at a structurally higher margin um, and uh, improved quality, less labor. Um, it's been um, the, the programs that, that we have undertaken have had a, a very nice return profile, and I do think that is a, a meaningful portion of our structural change in our margins, particularly in the HVAC side. When I think about some of these acquisitions, like Ingenia, which may be on your platform, you have much, much wider market reach. Have you been able to take that out to your full 
reach at this point? Or are you limited by capacity and their ability to get projects out? Right now, we're limited by capacity. Um, they had a, a multi-year plan. They have a humongous facility. There's a lot of equipment in there that, that, that we're actually uh, operationalizing. So this is a very good plan. But right now, the demand is, is very strong there. Uh, you're exactly right. They could, you know, if you think about it, they serve us. They're very strong in Canada. They serve a number of states, a smaller number of U.S. states. But where our strength lies is in our Marley brand, where we are everywhere, and we tend to have a very strong rep network. We tend to have, um, you know, good presence not only with the engineers, but with the mechanical contractors as well as the service professionals in each of those regions. So, you know, as we expand uh, capacity, we actually think we're going to see. And you're really talking about synergies, commercial synergies. We do believe those are there, and, and we are starting to capture that where we have capacity. But right now, in that particular business, uh, we want to make sure that we, we can meet the, the, the demand levels, which are, which, are, which are very high. Of course, of course. That's great. Thanks so much, Gene. Mark? Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Walter Liptak of Seaport Research. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, great quarter. Uh, one, well, you guys are touched on this with the, um, with the, you know, the growth. Uh, but I wonder if you talk about sort of your growth versus the market. Uh, do you think you're gaining market share, and uh, and I guess why uh, is it the, from the market expansion or is it new products? Uh, if you could provide some color. Yeah, so I think you uh, – and, and are, you, are you talking one segment or are you talking company overall, Walt? Oh, no, I, yeah, uh, sorry. I think focused on HVAC and the cooling business. Okay. On the cooling business, yeah, I do believe yep. we're taking share uh, there. Um, specifically, I would say, um, you know, our strength in the cooling segment has always been the large pro- projects. Because uh, we have done the large constructed projects in the past, we just have great technical competence in solving difficult engineering. So I would say that we have seen a lot of growth in larger projects, um, and that could be data centers, that could be uh, chip manufacturers, that could be uh, EV, and we are that's that's really in our our core. So I would say. Uh, there's been an en- enhanced level of demand in our particular area of strength. Second thing I would say is um, we had invented the Everest product line, and that's something we've talked about over the past several years. That has essentially gone from approximately zero to pushing $100 million of revenue, and that is taking share from constructed products in the market. So that is incremental growth to us that goes in our pocket that would not have been in our pocket. And that is a truly a a great innovation where even before we uh, invented the Everest, we had the largest tonnage cooling tower in the world. With the Everest, we were able to first increase it by 50%, and then with our current version and our new new versions, I think we've even doubled where we were before. So you're talking about going from 1,400, 1,500 tons to push in 2,800 plus tons. And a truly, uh, it's just a really good solution for the market. That has been particularly favored by uh, chip manufacturers and data centers. So I, I'd say that we, I do think we've taken share, and I do think it's a function of our innovation and our product management. Uh, but I also think it's a function of the market has moved in areas where we have some real strength. When you put those two together, I'd say that's why we take a chair. Okay, that's great. Um, and I wonder if you could just give us an update on um, on sort of those those growth businesses, chip makers, data center, EV. What percentage of uh, HVAC is that now, and, and what do you think the growth rate is on it? 
So, and I don't have, I'll, I'll, I'll give some, and Paul, you can pull out what we, what we have specifically, but if you look across pooling, where a lot of this activity is, I would say the biggest areas um, would be one, data centers, two, healthcare pharma, and three, institutional. So those are the very big areas. Uh, data center, we see a very attractive growth rate. Healthcare, the growth rate has maintained um, some, some very positive strength there. Institutional has been has been been healthy. On the you know what you would call industrial tech, um, that's a smaller portion. I'd say that's still growing. Um, you are seeing some projects get delayed. We have seen um, uh, we have seen an EV plant or a battery plant move out in timeline here or there. But as it pertains to our overall demand profile, I don't think it's been something that we have seen as being uh, material to us. So overall, and Paul, you want to get into a little more color here? You have the mm -hmm. chart running. Yeah, so uh, what we did call a data center as being around, and there's there's a slide I should say that I'm, I'm currently looking at in our investor day deck that uh, has uh, some breakdowns for the, the entire company. The data center is about 10% of the um, of the uh, cooling business, and that makes it around 7% of HVAC. HVAC. Of, of HVAC, yeah, uh, which makes it around 7% uh, uh, of the total company. And a lab and healthcare is about 9% of the total company. Um, institutional, again, is doing quite well, also around 9%. Um, so you've got quite a few, you've, we've got a broad industrial category in there that's 20, and that's where you're going to see some of this, you know, industrial tech that uh, Gene was talking about. Okay, great. And just as, um, just switching gears uh, to that, uh, that service project that you had, it sounds like that came in in the quarter and you completed it, is that right? And I guess if you could provide some detail of, you know, what was that regarding and, you know, is there business like that that you can go get in the future? Sure. Yeah, well, I'll start and then, you know, Paul, feel free to kind of add, add in. This was, this was, you know, a project that was, I don't know if I call it one off, but it was not something that we normally have uh, in our, given the size of it. It was a, you know, a cooling service project uh, that, that we completed uh, up in the northeast of the United States, uh, you know, and it was a was an attractive one for us just because it, it had a, a margin profile that we don't normally see, uh, you know, with these types of projects. So we were well positioned to go win it, and it, and it drove, you know, a high degree of profitability. You know, there's no comparable uh, project like that, you know, for the balance of the year. There was nothing in last year that looked like it. Yeah, okay. apart from that, well, let's say we just called it out, really, because it, as Mark said, it didn't have any uh, comparable in the other quarters of the year or in um, the uh, or in the prior year. So it does, and it's, you know, we just wanted people to be aware of it in terms of the comparisons going forward as well. Um, it, uh, I believe, it uh, it was in our backlog in the prior quarter. Um, obviously, came out of the backlog this quarter. So when you think about it, well, on a sequential basis. Or, you know, year over year, we thought it was beneficial that people understood uh, what that project is and that it was in there. Okay, great. Makes sense. Okay, thanks much. Thank you. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone. Again, to ask a question, press star 1-1 at this time. As there appear to be no further questions in queue, I would now like to turn the conference back to Paul Clegg for closing remarks. Sir? Thank you all for joining us on the call today, and we look forward to catching up with you at upcoming conferences and, uh, and investor engagement. Thanks. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.